Oh. All right. Good morning, uh, everybody. Good evening or, or good afternoon, depending for where are you located. Um, we are here at uh, the headquarters of uh, Seattle in Cali. Uh, welcome to this webinar. Um, I will quickly present uh, the core team of the COP um, and they are here uh, with me. So here's Danielle, here's Maya Camila, here is Vitske, and myself, I'm Silva. And um, we are very glad to host this webinar today. Um, thank you for joining. Um, uh, I will introduce also our presenters. So online we have uh, Mariette Mike Campbell. She will be the first uh, presenting. And uh, we have uh, Michael Carter uh, from uh, UC Davis. And um, as you saw uh, on the program, uh, Caroline Florey from uh, Erie. Uh, she couldn't join us, but uh, we have her presentation recorded, so she, we will be able to, to uh, see her presentation. Um, so the, the schedule is like this. Uh, we will now have a quick introduction uh, this webinar uh, by uh, Danielle, and then we will move on with uh, Mariette's presentation. Then we'll have uh, the presentation from uh, Caroline, and then um, uh, we have uh, Michael Carter. And uh, at the end, we have a 20-minute Q&A session uh, where you can ask uh, everything you want to the panel and to us uh, also. So I pass the floor over to Daniel for an introduction. Okay, hello guys, and thanks for attending to this webinar. Actually, I would like just briefly to provide you with some context on when this idea is coming from. So uh, it started years ago, as part of this big data platform initiative, the DGIR, we had uh, usually conventions. The first one took place here in Cali. And in that event, in that convention, uh, we, we saw uh, some scientists and, and high-tech people presenting a wide range of approaches or others in agronomic problems, like uh, pests and diseases, um, the most profitable crop, uh, weather forecast. But unfortunately, what we didn't see, what we didn't explain, what, what they didn't explain was like uh, the, metho the methods that they were using. Like most of them use artificial intelligence, machine learning, and all those methods, satellite imagery, but they didn't explain quite well why they, why they were doing this. We started to wonder like, at some point, you know, someone needs to, 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 to dig in a little bit more and, and, and see or a little bit deeper, see, you know, what's real there. So I remember back in those days in the late 90s or in the 90s when, when there were no standards for the way how growers uh, were implementing crop management. So our business companies took advantage of that situation and, and the, the market was overwhelmed by a lot of chemical products. So in the late 90s, there was one, one uh, initiative called Global Gap, like Global, grow, uh, grow, um, global um, uh, Agricultural Practices. And they kind of set up a standard that now is using it, it, even to, for making business. So we're not saying, we're not trying to say that we should do the same thing, right? But that at least we are absolutely sure that we need standards data-driven agronomic services and data-driven decision support system. So the idea as community with this webinar is a start, this will be like the kickoff of we as a community, how can we work together as a collective in, I think, in probably two years from now, to see what we can propose as a community in order to standardize more and be uh, more responsible with small-scale growers in the developing world. That's it, thank you. Right, thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, so, we will uh, rapidly move on, and I pass the floor over to Mariet, uh, if you're ready for the presentation. And thank you for the, for joining us. All right. Okay. Over to you. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Sylvain, for that feedback. Um, so, as I said, I'm uh, based with IATA in Rwanda, and I work on a project called ICT for BXW. It's a, a project that basically tries to see how we can leverage ICT technologies um, and citizen science to uh, improve the situation around, around control and prevention of uh, Xanthomonas gold disease in banana, uh, which is a, a widely uh, problematic issue in, in East and Central Africa and hugely affecting banana farmers. Um, besides that, I'm linked to a project called Evoca, which is a, a project that again looks into digital technologies within the African continent, and those are all kinds of technologies related to water and agronom uh, agronomic practices as well as human diseases. 
And so the idea is, again, to look into what can ICD, ICT actually mean for, for people and in terms of solving complex problems. Um, one of my research interests is, is very much related to what do people and technology do to one another, basically. So how are, how are they affecting each other? And this is why I became very interested in ICT for, tech, uh, for ACT, because it's seen as a, a growing field and it, it's getting a lot of uh, attraction. And uh, based on that, I, I reviewed a lot of the literature and I came to the understanding that there is many, many tools around there, um, and yet we know very little about them. So together with um, a scientist, Peter Thomas from uh, Biometries in Wageningen University, I'm currently setting up a literature review, a systematic review, into all these different ICT for uh, technologies that are out there. And our goal is to find out about what is the available evidence um, that these kinds of tools and technologies actually have a use and what they are contributing. And also looking at what kinds of tools are out there and what, what are their different objectives. Um, so based on that, we hope to really collect some data and that is um, shareable and, and that shows us a lot more and gives us more knowledge about this relatively new phenomenon that is ICT for agriculture and especially for developing countries. So that is particularly our focus. And the reason why is because we see that ICT for X is receiving so much attention and we see a huge number of different initiatives. But as I said, what do we actually know about if they work and how they work? So our aim is really to gather the kinds of evidence that would be required to say what works, what doesn't work, and who is really affected by that. So, in brief, what kinds of tools and platforms are we looking at? Well, our aim is to largely look from a client perspective. And talking about clients, we're mostly talking about farmers and local level actors, such as agronomists or buyers, which is usually the target group of most of these platforms, because we want to make a contribution to people's livelihoods. Um, and based on that, looking into that, I made a, a simple break up of the different typologies of these data-driven tools that are out there today. I deliberately only limited myself to those that are somehow related to agronomic practices, basically. So, of course, you could add categories like finance, but even though they have a relationship to agriculture and to people's ability to invest, for example, in agriculture, but they're not directly related to the data-driven agronomy, the way Mariette? I see it. Mariette, yes. sorry, uh, we're not seeing your screen. Can you share it, please? Uh, the way I... Okay, let me try again. It says it's sharing it now, so then can you see it? Yes, this is better. Okay, let me make it full screen again. Is it visible? Yeah, this is good. Okay, good, great. Um, so yeah, back to that. So basically uh, five different categories. Um, the extension category, which is largely about providing people with information and decision support, and diagnostics, all the different technologies out there for diagnostics of pests, diseases, all kinds of soil conditions, very much driven by NGOs and research still, which are integrating it with some of the more high-tech technologies, drones, machine learning, etc. Then I see that there is a growing group of uh, applications that are actually trying to register farmers. So, for example, here in Rwanda, there is a huge initiative right now that is even driven by one of the bigger banks, and that has the, um, the objective to register millions of farmers in Rwanda such that they can continue accessing subsidized fertilizers, but also to allow the opportunity to actually have more insight into farmers' practices. Then there is a category which is around weather, and I think that's also a growing a group of applications that is really looking into weather forecasts and providing decision support, sometimes linking it um, with insurance uh, packages 
as well as linking it to high tech, sensory um, data, imagery, etc. And finally, there is a group that is directly related to linking uh, farmers to markets, and that is very much in, in terms of making the value chain more visible and more transparent to all those actors that are actually um, somehow relying on that value chain. Um, so I, I tried to just give a few examples of the, the more well-known um, applications out there. Most of them are somehow also related to the work that the CGIAR is doing. For example, the Neuro application, which I think is very well-known within the big data community, um, but also ISOCO, which has been around for a very long time, started off looking mostly at markets, but today they actually have, have broadened their range of services that they're offering. I think that is another thing that we're seeing. Most of these applications start out very much operating in a silo and then start to broaden their scope and add more functionality over time. So in conclusion, I think there's a lot of ambitious, uh, motivated initiatives out there. And there's a lot of vision and, and mission, I think, for most of these initiatives to really try and make a change to farmers' lives. So, and when we look at that, they still have a lot in common. They have the kinds of traits that basically come down to the objective to bring people and um, services together, and also to gain more insights rather um, around what kind of information is available today, but also to add more information in terms of filling the gaps. And the idea is, of course, that with this technology, you can reduce the cost um, and improve the speed and the accuracy of information collection um, and sharing of information. Um, but I think there's, there's still a lot that we can learn and there's many challenges. And sometimes they're overlooked or they're maybe seen as something that would be easy to uh, improve or easy to overcome. So for example, I think the, the idea is that nowadays almost everybody has access to mobile phone technology and that I think is, is the key technology that provides people access to all these data-driven agronomy tools. Um, and yes, at the global scale, this is definitely true. And then when we're looking at, for example, in, in the country where I'm working, Rwanda, today about 80% of the population has access to mobile phone technology, looking at the number of registered SIM cards. Um, yes, the project that I'm working on conducted the baseline um, a bit earlier this year, and I, I basically just got access to that data, to that information. And looking at that, we see that there's still a group of 27% of the farmers that we interviewed, which was about 700 in our sample, that don't access mobile phone technology. So they just are basically inaccessible to us. And looking at what kind of ICT technologies they basically is that most of them purely rely on basic phones. And that is 70%. And there's only a handful of those farmers that can access the smartphone technologies and so also the kind of app technologies that would be required to um, use data-driven agronomy. Um, and at the same time, we see, and I think that's also important to notice, that some of these sort of conventional technologies like the radio are still crucial to most of the farmers to access information. Um, and then at the same time, another challenge is that the expectation is that access to smartphone um, devices and internet is very rapidly growing and that this is becoming something that will soon um, be a universal technology that's accessible. Yet again, um, the data from our survey among village level extensionists, which are the most important extension providers to the majority of farmers in Rwanda, shows that hardly any of them actually accesses smartphone technology or internet. Um, the reality is that most of them purely rely on calls and SMS, and many of them have huge issues by for example, affording themselves to make those calls. And if they can't, they still have to move around by foot. So a lot of it is much more traditional than maybe we're hoping for. Um, thirdly, uh, another challenge that I would like to touch upon is the sustainability and the profitability of the tools and platforms. And I think this is, again, a very important uh, factor to notice because many of the applications that exist today might not be around five years from uh, five years from now. For example, um, to quote some, some of the 
um, work that has been done by Jenny Aker, where she looks at, in 2011 at different platforms that are out there and, and sort of uh, reviewed all of them. If you look at those today, by far the majority is no longer accessible or they're not being maintained anymore. So it says a lot about the challenge of sustainability. And then some others that we basically know very little about yet. So um, this is one of our other review objectives. We have very little know-how about how um, data-driven agronomy might be affecting the indigenous ways of communicating and knowledge exchange, as well as what is happening to gender roles when women are starting to access technologies more? Is that affecting the way um, agro um, the way agriculture is taking place? At the same time, the expectation is that there's a good cost benefit through these kinds of technologies, but what do we really know about it? And lastly, I think there, the issue of scale. And when you look at it today, the scalability of many of the platforms are also questionable, and, and yet we have very little insight. Um, and lastly, I think this is one of the, the key points that definitely for our, for our review as well, is that we don't really know anything about the short and long-term impact. And I think the, the, the limitation there is that in most cases, we look into the short-term impact, or maybe not even impact, but just this output of the number of people that have registered. For example, just a few days ago, there um, was this publication by the Big Data platform um, about the partnership with Fiamo, where they're working in Malawi and they have about 700,000 farmers registered. And this is, of course, great, and this is definitely an achievement. Yet, what is happening beyond that registration? What is happening once someone has registered? Are they actually, actually actively using the platform? And if so, what is being done with that, that information that they, that they gather? Is it passed on to others? Does it actually turn into knowledge and know-how and changing practices? We know very little about that. So just to come to my conclusions, um, Firstly, I think there's a huge momentum for data-driven agronomy and ICT for agriculture. And we see that in the investments of donors and the, the kind of enthusiasm that this topic is, is gaining. Um, yet, we need to work on the science of it. We need to get the evidence right. And then related to that, I think there's a huge task for the different CGIAR centers and other knowledge institutes to work on gathering that evidence. It might not be the role of all the different NGOs or governments who are working in it. It might be a pure task where research centers could be hugely beneficial. Um, and this should happen to show that all the investments that are happening today are worth their money. And that in the end, we are benefiting farmers and other actors at the local level, level rather than over time discouraging them to further invest in technology. Um, I hope that this was um, an interesting sort of teaser. I'm very interested also to hear from the other speakers about their kind of practical experience. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the, uh, the Q&A after this and um, to a lively discussion. Thank you very much. All right. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Mariette. Right on time. And to participants, um, please remember that you were able to engage with us uh, through the chat. I think it's on the right hand uh, of your screen. So um, do not hesitate to post questions at any time. Um, after any presentation, we have a very short uh, four to five minute slot to, for very specific question on the presentation. So if you want to ask the presenter uh, something very specific uh, on the presentation, uh, you, are, um, <clears throat> you can do that and we'll take the question from the chat. Um, so, okay, actually we have, we have one. So, um, uh, Evaristo is uh, asking about uh, the gender roles. A very good point. Uh, do you have uh, gender disaggregated, uh, disaggregated phone ownership data? Question to Mariette. Yeah, actually we do. <laughs> um, I didn't put it in. As I said, this data is, is just um, just been uh, coming into our office and this is like, I took this from the draft report that we have on our data. But definitely there's gender aggregation and there's also aggregation in terms of age. Um, and we could further aggregate, aggregate based on education level. So yes, that information is out there. 
but I don't have it on hand right now that I could rapidly share it with you, unfortunately. But I'd be happy to share a bit more detail if people are very interested later. Okay, awesome. And um, now um, I'm hearing people. Okay. Um, um, we will move on to the following presentation. Um, the presenter is Caroline Flore from uh, ERI. So as I said, she was not able to join the live, but we have the presentation ready. So I will try to do the trick here. <clears throat> Let me see. I will share my screen now. It's one. Okay. All right, let's see if it works. Hello everyone, my name is Carolyn Flory and I'm the Technology for Development Lead at the International Rice Research Institute. And apologies for not being able to join you live for this webinar. Unfortunately, I'm on a plane currently from Cape Town to Manila. Um, but I wanted to share some lessons in technology for development standards, taking lessons from the digital health sector and thinking about their eventual or their, their um, potential, sorry, application to digital agriculture. So just to jump right on, jump right in, over the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes, we're going to, I'll, I'll start with a brief introduction to myself, talk about the problem statement um, that myself and uh, my colleagues on this webinar will be discussing, a brief introduction or hopefully a refresher to the principles for digital development, and then introducing a few reference frameworks and tools that have been launched in the digital health sector that could be interesting or have potential applications for digital agriculture. Um, as well. And so to introduce myself, just so you know um, why I'm talking about digital health specifically as someone who works at Erie. Uh, previously, I was at USAID as a private sector partnership specialist working on public-private partnerships that dealt with digital health, um, specifically working with private sector companies. And I was then at uh, United Nations Foundation is the mHealth Senior Manager working on a catalytic grants program for mHealth as well as the Saving One Million, Million Lives program in Nigeria. And after that, I was the Director for Collective Impact at the um, Digital Impact Alliance or BIO, which is also housed at U United Nations Foundation. And I've been with Erie since about January of this year, thinking about the use of digital tools um, at, for an organization that focuses on race research. And so just to launch right in, um, and I, I think my other colleagues are, are you know, have, have addressed this as well in, in terms of thinking about our core problem statement that um, in the digital agriculture sector, we're seeing a lot of different applications of, of technologies. Um, but the issue is there's no, we don't have a systematic way to evaluate and compare each of these different tools. And so how can we help um, various audiences from farmers to agricultural extension workers to governments really make informed decisions and compare apples to apples? Um, and think about how can we use standards to, to actually do that. And so before we launch um, or sort of go into the meat of the presentation, I just wanted to do a quick refresher on the principles for digital development, um, which is which are stewarded by the Digital Impact Alliance, but were founded and identified and, um, you know, written by the digital community, the digital development community as a whole, and thinking about how do we integrate these different principles into various stages of project implementation from the very beginning to make sure that as digital development professionals, we're thinking about designing with the user, understanding this larger ecosystem um, that, that we work in, um, as well as the other ones that, that you see here. Um, and hopefully this is, is a refresher and not, uh, not new information, but I would encourage all of you to dig into the digital principles if you're not familiar with them at digitalprinciples.org. And one of the reasons the digital principles were founded um, around 2012 was because of what you see here um, in Uganda in 2008. Um, those familiar or those who work in digital health are very familiar with this map as it's um, the first time there was an assessment of all of the digital health interventions in Uganda around that time. And so as you can see on this map, there were a number of digital health interventions, I think over 60 different ones. And the government realized, the Ministry of Health realized that they did 
didn't have a hold on and they didn't know what was happening in the country. And so there was an effort, there was actually a moratorium that the Ministry of Health put on the implementation of digital health programs to say, let's understand what's happening in the country. Let's put all of these, um, you know, put all of these together, understand what the interoperability potential is of these, who's doing what, where is their duplication of efforts. Um, and so it was the first time that, that uh, the Ministry of Health uh, really took control and took charge and said, We're, we need to understand what these different interventions are. And so that's just sort of a basis to say, you know, for the digital health sector, there have there has been this period of a thousand flowers blooming that we're kind of seeing in digital agriculture right now. Um, and so since then, there's really been a focus or, or since um, digital, or digital health has sort of started, there's really been a focus on building out the evidence base um, to make sure, you know, it, it is the health sector and there's a do no harm focus um, to make sure that we're that digital health is making use of the limited resources that are available um, to make sure that donors have increased transparency into the, the investments that they're making as well. Um, and so at the beginning, you know, really building that out because you had a lot of technical specialists, you know, be it from non-communicable diseases to maternal and child health, et cetera, who are very skeptical of the various um, interventions that were taking place to make sure that they actually were impactful um, and, and really uh, making a difference um, as well. And so what we see is that there was a real um, a focus on this evidence base um, and building out a shared framework or, or taxonomy. And in order to do this, as we think about evidence, it's building that out to make sure that we're able to communicate both within the digital health sector as well as outside of the digital health sector, um, to be able to talk about these interventions in the same way, to identify gaps and opportunities for action, avoid that duplication that we saw on the map of Uganda, um, and identify the opportunities where we can actually work together and complement the work that each of our organizations are doing. And so what I wanted to really focus on is, um, you know, after all of this evidence gathering took place, there was really um, an effort to build out a few core tools um, that, that were using the evidence and, and building upon all of the work that had been done. And so we're going to review a few of those um to over the next few minutes and so the goal of these is really to think about digital tools from a health system strengthening point of view um, to really improve the quality of care and outcomes um, in the in the health sector and so one of the first things that was done in efforts that from organizations such as the world health organization and johns hopkins university along with unicef was to map out what are the core challenges within the health system and so you can see the result of that work here in ac across these different um, pieces so information availability quality acceptability utilization efficiency cost and accountability and so in doing this and understanding what are the core challenges in the health system um, as a whole, not thinking about digital health, but what are the challenges within the health system, you can really kind of hone in on, okay, what are the specific ways that digital technologies can, um, can unlock these challenges? And so, you know, we see this, and this is directly applicable to the digital agriculture um, sector as well, taking interventions of known efficacy that um, there are a number of them in the digital and in, in health the health sector, um, right? So take uh, maternal and child health, for example. We know that an increase in the number of institutional um, deliveries of children is going to decrease maternal mortality, decrease child mortality. And so we know that that happens. Um, and we know that the ultimate outcome of that um, at the top right is in, in improving the quality and coverage of, of health intervention and increasing um, or decreasing mortality. But the issue along the way is that you see these different challenges such as services, you have to follow guidelines, commodity stock out, um, you know, depending on the various intervention of the sector that we're focused on here within health. 
Um, and so even though we know what the intervention, the proven intervention is to get to this outcome, we're not able to get there because of these specific challenges. And so what we see for mobile technology, again, similar in agriculture, is the opportunity to use these tools to, to overcome these specific challenges. And so using these digital strategies to address the constraints or these challenges. And so we see this in the agricultural sector as well at institutions like the International Race Research Organization and other CG centers. There have been a, a number of um, you know, intervention, science-based interventions um, for, for a number of crops that we know work, but there are challenges kind of plague us along the way to so we don't get to increasing the yields and incomes that we're trying to get to farmers. And so one of the things that was done in the digital health sector based on those various challenges was to think about, okay, now we know what these challenges are and we have a catalog of all of the different types of interventions that um, digital tools could be applied to. And so not thinking about digital health or M health as, as a monolith, um, but within, uh, within the sector, there was a, a, a very large effort to um, think about these 12 different categories uh, for digital health. And so you can see in some of these, just to kind of draw some of the parallels, ones like data collection and reporting would be similar. Um, uh, health records um, would be, you know, your uh, farmer diaries, for example. Um, number nine, provider training and education, agricultural extension worker training and education. And so you can really see, okay, these are the various categories um, where digital health interventions can take place. Going back, you can see at the top the various actors, right? So at the top, on the, the top left, you see that it's mother um, and child. And in, in the agricultural sector, that would be maybe the agricultural extension worker and a farmer, for example. And then you go down and think about, okay, what are the ICT applications for this particular um, intervention. Um, so for this one, it's only going to map out, out of those 12 categories, what are the specific ones that you could actually use? At the bottom of this slide, you can see the specific, um, the specific points in time where the interventions are going to take place. And so what this framework really allows you to do is kind of dig into the details of the, the where, who, what, when, how. And so here, you know, when along the continuum of care are you going to be using a particular um, digital health intervention? What is that intervention that's being enhanced? What are the specific health constraints that are trying to be overcome? How is the digital health tool being applied? Um, and where is the actual implementation going to engage? And so what's interesting here is, you know, and you can see some of the examples here as well and think about the parallels in the digital agriculture sector. Um, but what this allows you to do as an implementer or as an evaluator of, digital, of a digital health tool is to really think methodically about, okay, how am I going to be using this tool? What is the specific challenge um, that I'm trying to address so that you're not just throwing out digital, a digital tool just for the sake of using a digital tool, but you're using it for a specific purpose along the, the continuum of care that's addressing a very specific problem. And so again, as you see on this slide, it's only selecting a few of those ICT applications that are applicable for your particular intervention. And so this particular framework has been used in a number of other tools that have been developed by uh, the United Nations Foundation, by WHO, by Johns Hopkins University, and one of these is the Digital Health Atlas. And this is an, a web-based platform um, or catalog that is um, provides a guide for all of the implementations, provides um, uh, a platform to, to allow different agencies and um, different audiences to access and understand what are the interventions that are currently being used and implemented, where are they, um, and what, what stage of growth are they in. And so that's using the framework that we just saw, and this is um, kind of a screenshot of the digital health atlas um, and another tool that's been integrated into the digital health atlas is the m health assessment and planning for scale toolkit or the maps toolkit 
And this is providing actionable information to improve um, scale for and health interventions. And so again, going back to the principles for digital development, thinking about designing for scale um, from the very beginning and thinking about using this particular tool to say, okay, these are the different aspects of implementation that I should be thinking about to make sure that I'm implementing a tool that is uh, actionable um, and, and effective at the end of the day. Which parts of these um, you know, are stronger? Which parts of your intervention might be stronger and where there might be gaps or opportunities for improvement? And so integrated into the digital health atlas um, are these different components of the MAPS toolkit. So you can see, you know, for a given intervention, what their progress is in terms of groundwork or um, financial health, for example. And you can see the progress in as those improve do. The next tool that I wanted to introduce just very briefly is thinking about um, M Health Evidence Reporting and Assessment Checklist, or MERA. And so the guiding principle behind this particular tool is to think about or understand what is the M Health intervention, where is it being implemented, and how is it being implemented. And this provides a frame for standardization across the digital health sector. So, you know, there was a real effort to catalog the, the different evidence that existed. So, you know, going through a complete literature review, understanding what people are, are writing about and the research they're doing and the different interventions that are being implemented. But the issue in doing that assessment is there wasn't a standardized way for talking about digital health. And so there wasn't any way for us to build out an evidence base because we were talking about it in completely different languages. And so we weren't even able to um, compare um, against each other because there wasn't a way to, to understand what was actually going on. And so what MR actually does, and this is a very um, dense slide, so I would encourage everyone to kind of go through it at a later stage, thinking about these different criteria for M health evidence reporting so that as you are um, putting together your evidence for your particular intervention you're talking about it in the same way as you know your intervention in Senegal is talking about um, your SMS intervention for tobacco cessation in the same way that um, you know another intervention in Tanzania is talking about it for example. And so some of the challenges or some, I guess, some of the lessons from digital health that can be applied to digital agriculture in terms of thinking about, as I mentioned, sort of a thousand flowers blooming and what evidence is there to, for us to understand as a community, what is the intervention that works and what doesn't work? Um, how can we guide investments in this sector? Um, how can we break down some of the silos that exist? You know, we're talking about data-driven um, agronomy, but, you know, the breeders are talking about um, something else and um, you know the uh, the soil scientists are talking about other things so how can we make sure that we're all talking about it in the same way how can we also make sure as the technology does change on a very rapid clip um, we're talking about the same things uh, or we're staying ahead of the curve and we're integrating technology in a really thoughtful way and taking lessons from other sectors like digital health that might be a bit more mature um, than in digital agriculture I also wanted to mention, you know, governments as funders, and this is something that we saw a lot in digital health, is governments, um, national governments, state governments are making more investments in their own, um, in, in their sectors. Um, but they're not necessarily technologists. And so you have, you know, people in the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Agriculture that might be interested in the use of ICTs, but they're not talking to the Ministry of Finance or the Ministry of ICT necessarily. Um, and so how can we make sure that they have a better understanding of the interventions that are taking place? And also thinking about um, in the various geographies that we work in, regulation and policy is still catching up um, as well. And so I just wanted to mention <clears throat> across these three different um, pieces, the application or the, the lessons for digital agriculture in terms of evidence, catalogs, and frameworks. In terms of evidence, um, I think that there's a real opportunity in the digital agriculture sector to think about and, and um, really dig into what we know works and what does not work. Um, and I 
<laughs> would love to see this evidence base built up for digital agriculture in the same way that there was a real on it for um, for digital health, and also thinking about various catalogs that we could put together as a community for understanding what are the interventions that are out there, what's being implemented, are they being implemented well, are they being implemented at scale, um, and what's when what's happening, so we can do our work in a, in a very thoughtful way and thinking about the partners that we want to work with in a very thoughtful way. I mean, also building out some of these frameworks um, that, that we've similar to the ones that we see in the digital health sector um, so that we understand what we're talking about when we talk to each other. Um, and I think this community practice is a really interesting example, right, as well as the platform. So what do we mean when we talk about big data? Are we all on the same page? What do we mean when we talk about data-driven agronomy? Um, what does that mean to everyone? What is the common language that we as a community can have um, so that when we talk about something where we we know that we're all talking about the same uh, thing and so um, you know one example is uh, you know I, I'm guessing that everyone is familiar with this agricultural value chain that this is adapted from Chris Burns presentation at USAID um, in thinking about okay maybe this is one way that we could create a framework and thinking about the agricultural value chain and what are the challenges along each stage in this particular value chain and what are the digital interventions that could be used to address those specific challenges and so I'm right at the end of my time and just wanted to create to provide a bit of a summary in terms of, you know, we're a bit more nascent than digital health in some ways. Um, and we don't have to do everything at once. But I think it is important to always consider the principles for digital development as we do that and thinking about how can we build up the evidence or catalogs and frameworks to really guide the work that we're doing so that we have the most effective um, and impactful interventions at the end of the day. Uh, so thank you very much. Please feel free to contact me with any questions that you might have. Uh, and thank you so much for the invitation to join you today. I hope you have a, a great webinar. Take care. All right. <clears throat> Stop sharing my screen. Great. Um, so this was uh, Caroline Flores' uh, presentation from URI. Um, we, we thought it was uh, pretty inspiring to invite this kind of contribution from other sectors because what we've seen is that, uh, as she said in the presentation, other sectors have made a lot of progress on similar uh, issues or problematic that we are pretending to address now with this community. So um, I think we can um, hugely benefit from uh, what has been done in, uh, in different sectors. Um, all right, this is very good. Um, I will now pass the floor over to Michael, if you're ready, uh, for our last presentation. <clears throat> uh, yes, can you hear me? Great, yeah, that's good. Uh, Michael, thank you, the floor is over to you. Okay, and uh, are you seeing my screen now? We are seeing the screen, that's great. Excellent. Okay, so hello everyone, wherever you uh, might be. So what I thought I would talk about is a set of issues we've been wrestling with around uh, agricultural insurance. Uh, so let me jump right in. Uh, so first off, let me make sure we have a common understanding of what I'm going to refer to as index insurance. So when we think about conventional insurance or what I call here on the slide loss adjusted insurance, that's an insurance when the farmer has a loss, he then calls the insurance company and they send someone out to investigate the loss to make sure that it's a, a true natural disaster and not uh, the farmer not taking care of uh, his or her crops. Uh, it, for small scale farmers, that kind of loss adjustment simply is not cost effective. It costs too much money to send a person out to investigate what's happened to a small scale farmer. We have plenty of evidence that doesn't work. A lot of countries uh, tried that in the 1970s and 1980s and uh, created uh, disasters of their own. The idea of index insurance is to get rid of this loss adjustment phase and to find an insurance index, which is the basis of determining payments. This index is correlated with uh, the losses farmers experiences, but not identical to the losses that the farmer experiences. Uh, if the index can be remotely sensed, as an example I'll give in just a minute uh, is, then you, you, uh, you shortcut all these uh, costs, which traditionally have made it impossible to offer 
sustainably offer insurance to the small scale farming uh, sector. So most of current efforts to uh, use index insurance are based on some sort of remote sensing or satellite data. So on the left side of my screen, uh, I'm showing some NDVI maps from an area in northern Kenya where we launched a project a few years ago with the uh, with Ilri International Livestock Research Institute. Uh, this is a forage-based uh, contract, uh, NDVI signals, which is what's being uh, shown on those two maps on the left side. Uh, we were able to show that there's uh, a strong correlation between farmer losses and uh, and the behavior of the NDVI uh, measure. So when the NDVI measure falls below some uh, some level, then payments are issued. And uh, the current implementation of this, which is actually now being led by the government of Kenya under a program called CLIP, Kenya Livestock Insurance Program, uh, uh, the they are using all sorts of mobile technology so farmers can actually purchase the insurance uh, using. Uh, Using mobile phones, uh, payments are made through the, the mobile money system of Kenya. Uh, and again, there's no need for any the insurance company to show up and investigate losses. Payments are simply issued based on uh, based on what the satellite shows. So that's the that's the background on index insurance, and it's a very exciting uh, very exciting way uh, that, that big data is being used to try to relax constraints for farmers. Uh, so here on this slide, there's two points I want to make. First, um, there's a small but growing uh, impact evaluation literature, which examines the, the impact of index insurance. Uh, and for the most part, the impacts have been found to be quite large and actually be very, very cost effective. So obviously, the whole idea here is that if you can insure people uh, after a drought, if they have security, that uh, that the insurance will protect them and their families or protect their working capital and their farm, then that relaxes a constraint to their before the drought or ex ante behavior farmers become more willing uh, become more willing to increase their levels of investment in their farm. So for example, one study we did in Mali, we found that in the, and this was an experimental trial, we found that farmer investment uh, increased around 30 percent once insurance, uh, once insurance uh, was brought to the table. For those farmers, and these were farmers that on average uh, were cultivating about two hectares of cotton, this amounted to something like a 25% increase in their, in their family income. So really quite remarkably large responses. And there's, there's about five studies out there now uh, in Ghana, China, and a few other in India that find similar kinds of impacts. So that's the promise of index insurance is that if you have, if you have new seeds, if you have new technologies, new practices, but that actually uh, farmers are reluctant to adopt them because it's a financial or other kind of risk, then the hope is that index insurance can pull that risk out of the system and, and thereby generate large effects. So that's the promise of index insurance. Now, the picture on this slide is a woman in uh, Marsabit District in northern Kenya. She's holding her insurance contract from Takaful Insurance uh, Africa. And I want you to keep that picture fixed in your mind for, ju for just a moment as we, as we start talking then about the, the problems and, and the, the regulatory issues around uh, index insurance. So the first point I want to make here is that as I, I've stressed that the great strength of, of index insurance is that it's based on an index related to, but not identical to farmer losses. That's what makes the whole operation feasible to do. But it's also its greatest weakness because given that the index will never be uh, perfectly related to farmer losses, that raises the possibility and the reality that the farmer can have uncompensated losses. That's simply part of, part of the problem. Um, and indeed, perhaps because of, of that uh, issue around the weaknesses of index insurance, uh, a lot of index insurance projects have had real problems of low demand. They've never gotten off the ground. I, one of my early graduate students was, didn't, had to change his thesis topic because uptake of the insurance was so low, there was no way to actually study uh, its effects. 
more important than uh, broken dissertations is actually the problem of, of broken farmers. I'll be sharing with you in a moment some results of, of further analysis we did in a, a rice growing area of Tanzania. The background on that work is a large and well-respected NGO had launched an index insurance uh, contract uh, for a rice growing area where they were trying to get farmers to intensify uh, their cultivation of rice. And they had very uh, uh, buoyant expectations about how the insurance was gonna unlock the potential of these farmers to adopt improved uh, practices. In their very first year of the, of the scheme, the uh, Farmers had major losses, but the index insurance contract did not pay off. Uh, the way the contract was designed, uh, and again, it's remotely sensed, and it, it simply did not properly trigger. The NGO was horrified because they could see the level of losses that had occurred to farmers. They had a big fight with the insurance company. Uh, eventually, they, 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 they simply shut down the index insurance operation, not because they didn't believe it could have worked, but because the quality of that contract, that is its propensity to fail to pay off when farmers have uncompensated losses, uh, it was, was much too high. And there are lots of examples like that. I could go through a handful. You, the Economist magazine actually recently wrote something where there should be malpractice insurance for index insurance contracts because there, there are so many examples. There was a very large blow up in Rwanda about four years ago around exactly this issue of, of large reported losses for farmers and yet the, the insurance index uh, not triggering. So what I'd like to do then is, is in the remainder of my time is to share a little bit of information on the rationale for quality standards for index insurance and certifying them. Uh, and then I'll say a little bit about um, I'll say a little bit about what we're going, what we're actually doing now with a new grant to try to design uh, quality standards and actually certify them uh, in, in an effort to actually uh, help solve this, to solve this very particular problem. So um, let's go back or in our minds at least to the picture of the woman holding the piece of paper. So index insurance contracts are, for example, very similar to a hybrid maize seed in the sense that the farmer can hold either the insurance contract in her hand or she can hold a hybrid maize seed in her hand. And exactly what's going on in that piece of paper or what's going on in the genetics of that seed is a hidden trait. The farmer can't tell by looking at the seed or looking at the contract paper. Can't really tell if that contract is gonna protect her or not, or if those maize shields or maize seeds are really gonna to yield that, yield what is promised. Now, in the case of maize seeds, we all know that most countries actually, actually regulate seeds, they have germination tests, they have yield tests, etc. So when a seed is certified, the farmer can look at that mysterious seed in her hand and, and have some confidence that it's actually worth the money that's being charged with it, charged for the seed. In index insurance, we don't have any, at the moment, we don't have anything equivalent. The farmer can hold that insurance piece of paper in her hand, but she doesn't really know what's the probability that she will not be compensated when she actually has a loss. So in that sense, there's a, I think there's a direct correlation, if you will, between the problem of, of regulation of seeds and the problem of regulation uh, of insurance contracts, or indeed of any, any, kind of, uh, uh, any kind of technology where the quality of the technology is, is a hidden trait and can't be discerned uh, by the farmer herself when she looks at it. Um, if I'm an economist, if that's not already obvious, and if you put this kind of thing into an economic model, you can actually easily show that if there is no regulation of quality, it's very possible for the uh, insurance market to end up in a junk equilibrium, meaning the bad, the bad insurance contracts drive out the good insurance contract. And if an insurance company tries to enter the market with a good insurance contract, it's costly for them to do that and yet no one's going to believe it and no one's going to be willing to pay the cost. So I think the stakes here are quite high if we actually want this promising financial technology of index insurance to have its desired effect. Um, so what we're going to do here and what we're, we've been working on is trying to define what I call here on this slide a minimum quality standard. Uh, and the minimum quality standard is simply that the expected economic well-being of the insured is no lower with the insurance than without the insurance. 
So that's just a way of saying insurance contracts should not hurt the individual, should not make the individual worse off. Uh, there are ways, and I won't, go, I won't get too wonky in this talk, but there are ways using standard sort of economic tools to, to measure uh, whether or not an index insurance meets that contract. So what I'd like to do first, uh, and I'll spend a little more time on this first point is, let me just, I wanna really drive home what's going on with insurance and why this quality issue uh, is so important. And then I'll give you an example of actually how does one reach these kinds of minimum quality standards. And then I'll close with a few thoughts on, uh, on how we might certify these quality standards. So let me just jump to this picture and hopefully the, the size here is big enough. The, the horizontal axis here is just the level of income and the vertical axis is the probability that a certain level of income occurs. So just to make a real simple example, suppose a farmer faces a world where there's good years and bad years. Uh, in good years, the farmer earns $1,000. In bad years, the farmer earns $250. The bad years happen one out of five, so 20% of the time, and, and good years happen 80% uh, of the time. So that's what the farmer faces, if you will. That's the lottery the farmer faces without insurance. So if the farmer has a, a perfectly well-functioning insurance, then the farmer would face not the red bars, but would face the blue bars that have been squeezed in. So this is an insurance contract uh, where in, 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 uh, in bad years now, the farmer's income is boosted from 250 to 530. Uh, and then, but because the farmer is purchasing insurance, that in this example is being priced at the, what's called the fair premium or the actuarially fair premium plus a, uh, I believe this has a 20% markup, then the, the farmer's income in, in, the, in, the, in the good years is a little bit lower because she has to pay for the cost uh, of the insurance. So again, insurance, and I think this needs to be stressed, insurance isn't free. I've done a number of projects uh, on index insurance and, and typically a dollar that the farmer receives in a good year is costing that farmer about approximately a dollar fifty. And so the question is, you know, normally you'd say, would you pay a dollar fifty to get a dollar? And you'd say, well, that doesn't sound like a very good deal. But if you get that dollar in a time of need, and in a time of need, a dollar in a sense is worth more to you than a dollar, then you may very well be very happy to make that trade-off. So that's the, that's the guts of insurance is sort of squeezing together outcomes and giving up some money on average. Uh, in this particular case, the average income of the farmer with insurance goes down by about 5%. Uh, and the question is, would the farmer actually be better off giving up some income on average in order to have the stabilization effect, meaning pulling up, moving the, the outcomes in good and bad years closer together rather than having uh, a, a really negative year where income is only $250. So again, using standard economic concepts, we can, we can have something called certainty equivalent. We can kind of answer, we can kind of answer this question. So this diagram, which I won't talk about too much, is if we have perfect insurance, um, then, then we, if we look at the green line here, this is just showing uh, perfect insurance would be the far left-hand side of this diagram. And we're saying when the farmer goes it alone without insurance, the certainty equivalent for that farmer, the level of well-being, sort of standardized level of well-being for that farmer is about $740. Uh, when the farmer has insurance and the insurance never fails as a perfect insurance contract would, then you can see by the green line that the farmer's level of well-being is almost $800. Uh, so again, that's just a demonstration of it's, it's for a contract that works pretty well, we can see the farmer would say, sure, I'll give up a little bit of income on average in order to get rid of that uh, really, those really terrible years, which caused me to not be able to feed my family, to lose the capital if I've invested in agriculture, uh, et cetera. So that's perfect insurance. So hopefully that sort of helps fix ideas. Now let's look quickly at index insurance. So this kind of ugly looking picture is meant to demonstrate an index insurance contract uh, which fails from time to time. Uh, and in fact, the failure rate here is actually about equal to the failure rate we've actually seen in the most commonly implemented kind of index insurance contracts, which are rainfall-based contracts that are typically based on the CHIRP satellite data. So it's actually an estimation of rainfall 
uh, that occurs in a particular area, and then payments are made based on whether or not the estimated rainfall falls below uh, some trigger level. So what I want you to concentrate here, the, 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 the pink bars, again, that's what the farmer, those are the states of the world the farmer faces with no insurance. The blue bars here are what the farmer faces when the farmer has perfect insurance. And the green bars are actually what happens when the farmer has a sort of stylized insurance contract. And the thing to notice is in this picture, uh, the first thing to notice is there's a, a little green bar way over on the left. Okay. And as a friend of mine once put it, the thing with index insurance is the weakness of index insurance is that the worst thing that can, can happen to the farmer gets worse. So we notice with that green bar away on the left, there's actually a, a small probability that the farmer will be stuck having purchased the insurance and hence paid the premium, having had a bad year, but then not being compensated. And so that's exactly what happened in Tanzania, what's happened in Rwanda, what's happened in Ethiopia, what's happened in, in a project in Kenya, et cetera, et cetera. So the worst thing that has happened has become worse. And, and so that's the danger of index insurance is that it, it, it's a remotely sensed product. It has a certain spatial resolution. It has a certain accuracy to its ability to recognize when farmers actually have losses. And if it fails, if it gives what I call here on this, this bar on the left-hand side is a false negative. If a false negative happens, meaning the farmer had a loss, but the contract falsely says that, uh, falsely says that the uh, the loss did not occur, then the farmer has actually been damaged by the presence of the insurance. And you can pretty easily imagine, I hope, that uh, that if, if those false negatives happen very frequently, the farmer's not going to be better off with insurance. The farmer would say, forget it. I don't want an insurance that sometimes helps me, but sometimes doesn't. Uh, the other side of the diagram shows what's called a false positive, which is also an issue in index insurance. So a false positive is when the farmer uh, does not have a loss, but receives an insurance compensation. And so that's the bar on the green side, which shows a farmer who actually had a good year, but received an insurance payment. Now, at first look, that may seem like a good thing, like the farmer got money isn't that good. But again, you need to remember the principle of insurance, that every dollar the farmer is getting is probably costing the farmer a uh, dollar fifty. And so receiving a dollar in the good state of the world when a dollar is worth just a dollar, receiving a dollar for which you paid a dollar fifty also makes the farmer uh, worse off. So this is the danger uh, of index insurance. We have its promise. We have its ability to implement contracts with small scale farmers or small scale pastoralists. That's extremely exciting. But all index insurance contracts have some element of this problem embedded in them. And the challenge then is to, to look for actual contracts uh, that can meet a minimum quality standard. So let me skip over this is just, if any, I, I suspect these slides will be made, be made available, but this is just showing that uh, if, the, if the failure rate on an index insurance gets too high, then it actually fails to meet the minimum quality standard and the farmer would actually be better off without the insurance than, than with the insurance. Or if the insurance is subsidized by the government, uh, the equivalent calculation would say, the farmer would say, just give me the insurance subsidy money. I'd rather have the money as a cash transfer than having you buy me a low quality insurance co uh, contract that has uh, too high false positive and false negative kinds of compensation. So I think I've already said a lot of this is that, uh, you know, this is not just a hypothetical example. Uh, almost every index insurance project that runs on for a while eventually runs into what is sometimes called a basis risk event or what I've been calling a false positive or false negative. Um, and let's just look at this little diagram uh, here to kind of think about the sources of, of false positives and false negatives. So this perhaps not entirely transparent picture, the width of that blue box, you can think of the width of that box as being the total risk that the farmer faces. And we can break that total risk into two pieces. There's risk that's correlated risk, that is risk that's common to everybody, say in a community. And there's risk that's purely idiosyncratic. So we typically think about weather risk as being a correlated risk. We think about uh, uh, animals trampling down your field, as being an idiosyncratic risk that just influences the impact of one farmer. Now, we can further subdivide correlated risk into two sorts when you have an index insurance contract. 
there's the risk that the uh, the risk that's actually properly covered by the contract, and then there's there's what I call here design risk. So design risk is when an insurance contract fails to properly predict even losses that are the result of correlated events. So in my example in Tanzania, that was a correlated risk. All the farmers in this one particular area suffered large losses, but the insurance contract didn't even properly predict the average losses of farmers. And then on top of that, we have the idiosyncratic risk, meaning uh, I may have larger losses than a neighbor farmer, but index insurance is never going to cover that idiosyncratic risk. So when we think about designing high quality insurance contracts, what we need to do is get rid of as much design risk as is humanly possible, squeeze that out. And there's still going to be an issue if the idiosyncratic risk is too large, then it may be that even a well-designed contract that properly, uh, that properly predicts uh, average losses within a community, even that that well-designed contract may not actually be may not actually meet a minimum quality standard. So, to give an example, we were invited to look into the possibility for doing index insurance in Nepal a couple of years ago. The funder was very interested in uh, in the hilly regions of Nepal. Uh, when we looked into it, we realized that almost all the risk was idiosyncratic, uh, simply because the terrain was so hilly and variable. One farmer could have a, a, a frost event and her crops would die. And just, you know, 300 meters away, the farmer was perfectly fine. So even if we had been able to predict average yields correctly for farmers or average losses correctly for farmers in that community, there was still going to be huge variation that was uninsured. So again, I say this because I think we need to be really careful uh, thinking about index insurance. I think it's promising. That's why I keep working on it. Uh, and a lot of other people do as well, but we need to recognize it's not it's not going to work everywhere, and it's not going to work anywhere if we don't work on designing contracts that eliminate uh, design risk. So I think in the interest of time, let me just say a tiny little bit about some of the work that we've done, um, and we've implemented this recently in Tanzania and Mozambique both. So we designed a high quality uh, remote sensing contract that gets more or less correct average yields uh, within a within a village. So that's the insurance zone. Uh, but we recognize that our remote sensing uh, sometimes uh, fails us. So here's an example of, of uh, this diagram here. The horizontal axis is showing the actual yields that farmers have had in a village in a particular time period. And the vertical axis is showing our predicted yields. The, uh, the diagonal line is the 45 degree line. If we had perfect prediction, right, then we would, uh, all those dots would lie right on that, on that diagonal uh, line. And what you can see, if you sort of stare at this a little bit, you can see that actually the satellite predictor is pretty good at picking up losses. But if you go over to the left side of the line, you can see when farmer losses were around 50%. That is, their yields were 50% of their normal yields. The satellite was way over predicting their yield, saying that they were only at 85% of the yield. So what we've done with this, uh, with this audit-based system is, number one, we work very hard in ground truth and try to create a reliable insurance index. Uh, and then secondly, we have a backup audit system. So if, for example, in the maize contracts we've been doing in Tanzania and Mozambique, we announce whether the satellite will pay uh, or not, the index, the insurance will pay based on the satellite index. Roughly 100 days into the season, we're technologically able to make that determination, and that gives farmers a few weeks to actually request an audit uh, as they go along. And um, to make that cost effective, the audits can't happen very often. And in, in the case of Tanzania, they they happen no more than about, I think it's about four percent of the time where an audit is actually necessary. So that, that cost was actually rolled into the insurance uh, contract. Um, so again, I think in the interest of time, let me, this, is, this diagram here is just using real world data and showing that we can actually apply this minimum quality sta uh, standard to different contracts. And it shows the, the trade-off between quality and and cost of different insurance contracts. But the point here for our purposes was simply to make the point that 
uh, it's indeed possible to design contracts that meet a minimum quality standard, but it takes, it takes some work. It takes collecting some data from the client farmers so you can actually determine what the probabilities of loss are. And then I would ultimately say it takes doing a few institutional things like creating a backup audit, because if you don't do that, you're, you're really putting uh, farmers at risk with this uh, 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 risk of an insurance contract making them worse off. So to summarize, if we want to design a contract for quality, uh, we need to work on scaling down the insurance zones to the smallest possible level. And again, the, uh, the work we've been doing that I mentioned in Tanzania and Mozambique, that's using pixel resolution off the MODA, off the, uh, MODA satellites. It's 250 meters by 250 meters, so that's about six hectares. We're actually working now with some uh, in an exploratory way with much higher resolution data. So the new European Sentinel satellites have 30 meter by 30 meter resolution. We have a private company provided us some data called Planet Labs provided us data that's at three meter by three meter resolution, which is obviously getting very, very uh, tiny. So I think in the end, we can work hard on pushing the technology as, as far as we can, but we need to ground truth. We need to get rid of this design risk. I think we need to consider backup fail safe audits so we don't actually uh, hurt farmers. And if we've done a good job, good job designing contracts, the cost of that fail safe audit uh, should not be too high. And the final point I made here is sort of the Nepal point. We simply need to be aware that in some environments, the nature of risk is such that index insurance is just not going to work. Uh, the idiosyncratic risk element is simply too high and no contract will work. So the final slide I want to use then is this one. So we've been talking about this for a long time and we recently received a grant from USAID to establish what we're calling quick for quality index insurance uh, certification. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're, we've got a meeting actually next week in Nairobi working with uh, insurance companies, reinsurance companies, with government line agencies that are promoting or are interested in index insurance. We're bringing these groups together uh, from, from uh, Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda. And we're going to try to see if we can create a, a community interested in quality certification. We have a remote sensing group uh, based in Nairobi that also works with NASA. Uh, and they will they will hopefully serve as a as a as a as a certification uh, body. So this is our idea: is to say remote sensing is exciting. It can, in the case of risk, it has this potential, as I said at the beginning, to have really gigantic impacts. But it's not going to have those gigantic impacts if it if it actually fails farmers or fails them uh, too frequently. So we need to do something here about defining uh, quality standards and implementing them. So let me stop here. And I hope that was a, a useful introduction to the use of big data and some of the challenges that come about when uh, farmers are confronting whether or not to purchase products that are based on this kind of big data. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, for this great presentation. Um, <clears throat> I think it's really interesting the point you made on the hidden traits and uh, in the end, uh, are we able to determine if uh, farmers are better or worse when they have such a contract or in our case uh, they use one of the digital services that are out there so um, <clears throat> i think it's great because it's a very similar and um, problematic so uh, we will now move to the q and station um i will invite um participants to submit uh, their questions to the chat, uh, they can uh, you can ask anything you want um, uh, regarding the, the main problematic on the, the standardization and the need for standards in data driven agronomy services, uh, or more specific question to the to the presenter on the presentations. Um, and uh, also, while we are doing the Q and A, uh, I invite participants uh, to enter in the, this Mentimeter. So the idea is to do a quick poll and to ask about your opinion. So you just have to go to that webpage menti.com and you use the code that appears on the screen and then you can submit your uh, your vote. All right. So, uh, <clears throat> right. Um, waiting for participants to submit questions. Um, 
we actually had uh, some here prepared. So I wanted to ask to Michael, um, <clears throat> up to now, what has been the reaction of insurance companies to your initiatives of, of setting standards? Uh, would you say there is a good buy-in, like this, they are seeing the opportunity, or uh, are you seeing uh, more reluctant? Yeah, so I've been, uh, I've been talking about this issue for uh, some time to people and to insurance companies. And I think initially there was a lot of resistance and they said, well, we know it's not perfect, but who cares? And I kept saying, you know, you have brand risk here. Um, and I think slowly as these kinds of events have happened, namely, uh, you know, I mentioned the example of Rwanda, the president of Rwanda, at least the, the rural myth is the president of Rwanda got on the telephone with the president of the World Bank which had sponsored the contract and, and told him some rather unkind things about the World Bank and how could they possibly be promoting these failure-prone uh, contracts. So I was just at a meeting in, uh, in Switzerland recently that brought together a lot of people on this topic. And I was quite heartened, uh, actually, the head of Swiss Re, uh, or not the head of Swiss Re, but a, a quite high, highly placed individual within Swiss Re said, you, you know, we agree we've seen enough of these and it's now time to have a quality standard because right now we've got sort of an unregulated uh, market and, and we need to do, we need to do something about that. So I think the, I think the industry is actually now ready for it. They were, I would say based on my own experience and having had lots of fights <laughs> with some industry partners before, I don't think they were ready for it five years ago, but I think, I think the industry is starting to recognize that we need to be a little more careful and I keep, and the donor community, at least those that get forced to listen to me rattle on, I think is also becoming uh, is becoming quite sensitive to this issue as well. And I, I think if we can get those two partners together and, and donors and, and governments are sensitive to it as well, getting donors and governments to say, look, we want a quality standard. And, and uh, if it can be even a voluntary standard like ISO certifications are purely voluntary and yet they carry information. So that's what we're hoping uh, we can we can move toward. And I. I'm, I'm naively optimistic. Talk to me again in a week, and maybe I will have suffered bad things in Nairobi and discovered that the support is not there that I that I think is. But I, I do think it's time, and I think it's possible to move forward in the ways we've been discussing. Great, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, because yeah, actually, uh, one of the hypotheses we are having is that uh, eventually this kind of standards. Uh, could benefit uh, all the stakeholders and including the, the providers because they could uh, compete on a common basis and so they could promote the services in a better way and with uh, you know um, objective information and, and comparable. So that's a little bit uh, the hypothesis. Yeah, um, and just just real quickly on that, as this may throw out an idea to someone. So part of what we're going to do is we're going to you know we're going to have some trial certification standards. And we're actually going to try to segment the market. We'll have to figure out exactly how we're going to do this. But we're going to try to test for the in industry themselves is if this is certified, if we publicize the mark, the quick mark, so to speak, uh, and advertise that to farmers, will that actually have a beneficial impact on the demand for their products? Because again, as, as I mentioned earlier, often demand is kind of low. So I, I, we're hoping we can get the buy-in of the industry because they'll see that it is indeed in their in their in their interest as providers to to have certification right great <clears throat> thank you michael um so um we are still taking the chat so um, participants uh, feel free to submit your questions and uh, meanwhile I, I have one for to mariette so um, the question is what uh, what value would you expect from standards uh, in fostering adoption by thinking of the problem of the trust uh, from users that they can have or lose in those tools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think it's a good question, but um, I think we could we could quite easily link that to most likely the experiences that we all have on a day to day basis. I think um, when I look up a new product or a new application, and I'm going to my um, my uh, Google Play Store and I look at the different applications out there for a purpose that I that I'm looking for. And one of the things that I consider is how is that application being rated? What are the reviews? How many stars does it get? So I take that into account. But I think if we could have also for, for ICT for Ag applications, a good way of uh, validating them and, and 
having a way to assess their quality and how well it can meet the demands of the users, then I think that would definitely help in the adoption of um, the applications. But you have to take uh, into account there that that would only account for those that are actually good applications, right? So it would be a way to also uh, sort out which ones are the good ones and, and are worth uh, your time and your investment, and which ones are the ones that you just don't have to bother even thinking about. Um, so I think it can help in, in the adoption of some of them and actually it can reduce the total number of applications out there and make it a lot more efficient and, and also potentially help, for example, donors to find out where they would have to invest their money. Great. <clears throat> That's right. Thank you, Thank you for, for your answer. Um, I think we don't have questions yet on the chat. Um, I just wanted to thank uh, presenters because I, I really liked the different angles you, you adopted to contribute on the problematic. So we saw with Mariette <clears throat> how you're trying to tackle, tackle the problem of diversity by, by building a, a, a review, a typology, so that we can, uh, I mean, uh, navigate among this diversity <clears throat> uh, easily. And uh, we saw that um, Caroline brought the example from uh, the, the health sector, uh, which in which uh, there are a lot of uh, advances and progress made on um, uh, precise, precisely um, looking at the different tools and trying to rank them and, and classify them so that it's it's uh, clearer. And uh, and then we have the, the um, nice experience from uh, Michael uh, about this problem with insurance uh, index and, and contracts uh, that have hidden traits and how can we help users to uh, make a better decisions on whether they would benefit from a contract uh, or not. So uh, right now, uh, I invite people to vote on the second question. This is the last one on the mentee. And then I will pass the floor over to Daniel uh, for a quick uh, wrap up. Um, Daniel? Uh, sorry, so we have, we have questions coming out. So we will take uh, <clears throat> the first one is from uh, Manka. Uh, the bigger concern I see, at least in Cameroon, is that farmers aren't actually asking for index insurance. Uh, we are trying to do some pilot here. Uh, there are, there's no regular framework for insurances in uh, Cameroon. So this was very informal and realized there was uh, just very little demand for the service. I guess this is a question from Michael. Okay. Uh, thank you for that, uh, that question. And, and indeed, I mean, this is part of what makes insurance a novel technology. Uh, people, uh, all the farmers we deal with, they've never had, they, they may know about motorcycle insurance at most, but they don't really understand how crop insurance uh, might work. So there's a, there's a large educational uh, thing. And, and, you know, if you think about, let's go back to maize seeds, right? When a, when a company introduces a new variety, they typically will give farmers a, a little pack of 250 grams of seeds and say, here, try this out yourself. And if you like it, then you'll buy it next year. Insurance is a really difficult thing. And this, this relates a little bit to some of the earlier discussion. It's very hard to learn about how good insurance is, right? Because insurance is only going to trigger a payoff once every five or six or seven years. So even if you gave farmers a 250 grams free of insurance, they might have to wait five or six years before they do it. Uh, before they could actually learn anything about whether they like it or not uh, and, and understand how it works. Um, so maybe in the Cameroon, uh, so I run a research group called BASIS, so BASIS period UC Davis period EDU. We've gone to developing various kinds of simulation games where, you know, so if the problem, the learning problem for insurance is it takes many years to learn about it. So by creating a simulation game, so we just have one on tablets now we call Sim, Sim Pastoralist, which we just used in Samburu County in, in Kenya. That kind of device can allow people to start to understand. So the games are framed on people's realities as farmers or as pastoralists. Uh, they, you know, it's a simplified version, but if it's close enough, people get it and actually enjoy it. And they can play their, their, their live you know, they can live their life once without insurance. They can go through 20 seasons and see how things work and the shocks they face and what happens to them. And then you bring in insurance and say, here's how it works and it costs some money. And then people can play the game with insurance and they start to understand. And then 
typically after people understand how insurance works, then we play an incentivized game with them so they can then say, okay, do I want to buy it or not? And we pay them based on, you know, their final wealth or well-being of the family, depending on how we, we set the game up. So you're exactly right. It's a, it's a new it's a new it's a new uh, technology. It's a complicated technology, but I think I think we have found that um, at least starting with a community or community leaders, there are some things you can do to help people understand. So if you go to that web page I mentioned, searching around, you should be able to find some examples of of some of these insurance games that I th I think are a starting point, uh, at least to, so you can have a start to have a discussion and people will at least have some idea what you're talking about with insurance. All right, thank you. Thank you, Manka, for your questions. The question, uh, so I pass the floor to Daniel for, for a quick wrap-up. Okay, so first, uh, thank you guys uh, for, 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 for presenting. I mean, you all, uh, Mariette, Caroline, and Michael gave an excellent presentation. So, but, uh, but I, I just figured out that I, I forgot in the beginning, so I didn't say that uh, I'm the leader of, of, of the community or practice. I'm a trained agronomist and with, with the data science skills. And I'm very happy to see, I mean, this discussion that I, I taking place right now, this is actually what we were looking for. Some takeaways, messages, or I mean, something that I can really take from, from, from uh, Maria's presentation. I'm looking at my notes. Like when showing this body, uh, diversity and landscape of different data-driven services, well, I, I was surprised to see you know, that not necessarily private sectors are running all of them. Like you can also see like a key role of NGOs uh, running some of those services. And pointing out that, even though they are not all private sector, coming from the private sector from a, from a profit uh, perspective, they all have a clear mission and vision. So in the long term, I think uh, they, they're good, just that we need to work more on, on what the data-driven services are and, and, and the methods they use and the transparency. And also that is very important and she brought uh, from the presentation is this journey perspective and how it can be affected, right? Uh, from Caroline, I mean, this is an amazing and very inspiring presentation from the health sector. I mean, showing us even the principles of digital development, which probably many of them, some of us, few of us are not very familiar with. And like this roadmap that the crops, that the health sector is, is following, right? Like they know where, how, and when to make the interventions. Uh, they show this maps toolkit. I didn't know it, but it seemed like at the beginning, I thought I was like a USAID, USAID uh, document because it really looked like, like only my attention, they like, Probably because they will be interested in, in something similar. Um, one question that I had for for, my, for for Caroline was like the science evidence that she was talking about. Because something that we struggle is like the speed of publishing papers is not the same of, of the of the market of private companies. So I, I would like to to, to ask uh, what's the science evidence that she was talking about? And for Michael, I mean Michael was presenting like a the economic perspective. Of indents uh, insurance, and I really uh, took my. I, I was really uh, happy to see, you know, like the, the, how he presented this idea that this is to actually make think farmers that they shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't think that they are limited by 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 some technology because this is actually what these uh, index insurances are meant to. And the rational behind all of this, from not only the economic practical, but also the academic perspective, which we don't see too many of those. We don't see too many of those, like tackling the three perspectives, usually in the, the, the academy is very different. So I'm very pleased to, 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 to listen to Michael and his perspectives and, and the way how, how he made a point that in some, um, that as economists, uh, if there are no regulations, this is not good. But I also heard some other economists from the banking perspective saying that in these type of cases, uh, usually the market itself will get rid of those that are um, uh, weaker, right? So this is a different perspective, but usually that, and I talked to Silvan about it, is that, that happens in markets that are already in place. In this case, this is an emerging data and agro, data and agro market. So it's a totally different perspective, and we should think more in the way probably Michael is, is thinking about it. So I think that's what I took from my notes. And All right. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel, for this wrap-up. Uh, we are now reaching uh, the end of uh, our time for this webinar. So um, I would like to thank a lot our presenters for their contribution, to thank participants to join us today. And I want to invite everybody uh, to follow us. Uh, you can go to the page uh, uh, I'm sharing on the screen and we'll share the link 
later on. And this is the landing page of data, the data-driven agronomy community practice, where you can uh, get um, information about the coming events. We are hoping to host uh, um, other webinars uh, early next year. And also, uh, early next year, we plan to put together a working group uh, that will be in charge of uh, gathering the contribution of the community on this topic and hopefully uh, to be able to write some kind of reference document to move forward and to start um, uh, build a, a scheme, a reference scheme for, for the standards in data-driven agronomy services. Uh, so thank you uh, very much uh, to everybody and uh, we hope to see you next time uh, on the COP webinar. All right. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.